Hello and welcome back to the World Music Podcast. I am your host, Will Marsh. Here on episode 9, I am speaking with Shambhavi Dandekar. She is the Indian classical Kathak dancer par excellence who has dazzled the world with her performances and choreography. Her institution, Shambhavi's International School of Kathak, or SISK for short, has made its presence felt around the world with branches in India and the USA, currently teaching over 400 students. Shamavi has trained under both her own mother, Guru Manesha Sate, and under Tabla Virtuoso, Tal Yogi Pandit Suresh Talwalkar. She is a member of the International Dance Council of UNESCO. Well, this was a great conversation with Shambhavi Ji, and if you're not familiar with Kathak dance, it's an incredible art form from North India where the dance and music are very closely intertwined. And this episode will be a great introduction for you into this fantastic art form. And if you're already familiar with Kathak, you'll just love hearing uh, Shambhaviji's insights on a life devoted to this art form. Well, this interview was originally recorded on January 28th, 2021. And now for our conversation with Shambhavi. Enjoy. So today I'm very excited to welcome Shambhavi Dandekar to the show. And um, she is a renowned Kathak dancer. And I had the good fortune to meet her while in India through my Guruji. And she is also in California in the Bay Area where I reside. So it's just wonderful to be connecting with you today, Shambhavi. Thank you so much, Will. Thanks for inviting me. My pleasure. Well, I'd like to start off today. You know, some of our listeners might not be familiar with Kathak dance, and I would love for you to kind of describe what Kathak dance is as if you were talking to someone who, who just doesn't know about it. That's a good question for starters. Um, so um, India has a rich tradition of classical dance and music. Everybody knows that. Um, there are several classical dances emerging from various geographical regions of India. Kathak happens to have evolved in the North Indian region. Um, Kathak is uh, basically a dance form which gives a lot of importance to storytelling. So various stories from Indian mythology are typically uh, narrated through mime and through gesture language with the help of musical accompaniment, with the help of um, technical uh, language. Kathak um, finds its roots in the temples of North India because that's where it was originally presented. Going forward, due to the um, Mughal invasions, uh, Kathak started being performed in the courts of the kings. And that also brought in some Persian um, influence because artists from Persia used to visit the kings uh, regularly at that time. Going forward, after India gained its independence, Kathak started being performed uh, on the proscenium stage, and that is where um, I would say its real evolution started in the contemporary world. Uh, Kathak basically uh, is divided into two parts. One is technical dance, in which a dancer uh, portrays beautiful movements of the body on the canvas of space around her. And then the storytelling, where, uh, as I said before, various stories are performed through dance. Uh, a signature of Kathak, uh, if one asks me, I would say, is uh, fast and um, intricate footwork and uh, numerous spins or pirouettes and a very natural style of mime. So a uh, style of mime which is not really constricted into the gesture language as many other dance forms uh, of India are. So it's very natural, it's easy to understand. And this um, dance form is very flexible in nature. So it gives uh, the practitioner a chance to, um, uh, to jam with various uh, other musical disciplines of the world and to basically incorporate uh, new streams, new thoughts, so on and so forth. 
if you look at the the way the dancer dresses up uh, you you see that uh, it's a typical indian dress with a long skirt and a blouse and a, a scarf that is called dupatta and a lot of times we also find dancers wearing uh, tight pants and a long um, a uh, dress that we call anarkali a uh, beautiful ornaments a long uh, plait so that is how the dancers women dancers uh, dress up and male dancers dress up i would say um, um in a subdued way uh, with uh, just a kurta and uh, pants and a sash around their waist so this is all that i can think of about uh, kathak if i have to introduce this to a newcomer well i think that gives us a great picture of uh what this dance is like and you know we'll we'll talk about more of the details but yeah that that's a great description thank and you and so music and dance run in your family mm-hmm. and you were trained by your your mother mm-hmm. in the art of kathak dance and i'm just curious if you could share a bit about what it was like growing up in that environment and you know were you initiated right after you could walk did you start dancing or you know how was it um to grow up in that type of musical and dance lineage um i was really fortunate to be born to a mother who is uh, still a uh, practicing kathak dancer and mm-hmm. teacher um so uh, i think i started dancing right when i was inside her <laughs> she <laughs> yeah. was carrying me uh because she tells me that uh she used to teach uh, full term till she gave birth wow. to me and uh, she also uh, performed uh, early on when she was like you know four or five months uh, with me hmm. so uh, it must have started back then uh, i have vivid memories of uh, watching her dance or watching her teach other students from my age of four or five years i would say and uh, then in my family we had my grandmother who was a play director theatrical director hmm. so um, aside from my mother's dance activity that used to um, go on at home we also used to have my um, grandma's um, theatrical rehearsals going on so i used to hang out over there hmm. and um, i used to love watching those characters and their interactions and uh, by the end of the day i would have all the dialogues by heart and i would not even want to uh, exit the room even to have a meal or uh, you know nothing so uh, in addition to that my father was deep into spirituality and mm-hmm. philosophy so uh, there used to be this sanskrit chanting going on at home and uh, he was deep into meditation and spiritual discourses so i think as a child i was taking in from you know all these influences around me but then um, my mother uh, started uh, letting her, letting me into her classes when i was 4 uh, uh, years old so i had a bunch of uh, friends from my school and all of us used to learn together from my mother so you know there was uh, there is this nice um, you know, feeling of learning with friends and um, we used to dance in school as well so it the journey kind of started from there uh, going forward i learned in my mother's class classes as well as individually from her but then at the age of 17 18 when i showed a serious promise uh, she took me under her wings and then trained me to become a performing artist hmm. wow what a rich uh, environment to be brought up in and so you mentioned you know 17 18 there was this kind of understanding that you wanted to go into performing and from that young age like was there a point where you knew dance is what i want to do with my life with my career did that happen early on or was there a particular time where you remember like that very clearly um or was it just kind of something you knew from very very beginning 
honestly i didn't know if i wanted to make a career out of dance early on mm-hmm. uh, i loved dancing i didn't mean i didn't miss even a single class and i was always uh, looking forward to being a part of my mother's uh, performing troupe uh, since i was 15 16 years old um so i loved all that but i also loved acting in the plays in my mm. college uh starting from the school actually and then i loved singing um i loved elocution so basically i loved everything but um i wanted to be a political interpreter huh. <laughs> so wow. so um you know like any indian child i was already speaking marathi hindi english and then in school i learned sanskrit and in college i learned french and wow. my plan was to become a political interpreter well somewhere in between i just asked myself that uh, you know these are too many things so i want to focus on something which is long lasting and which does not um, uh, at which I, i i won't get bored ever in my life so the answer was dance and mm. that's how slowly all other activities surrounding me they kind of took a back seat and uh, i brought my entire focus on dance that happened at my age of 18 i would say and then going forward i always used those influences those experiences from the other arts that i had i used them in dance but my entire focus was to pursue dance as a career wow yeah i find that fascinating how every artist kind of comes to a point where it's like this is what i'm going to do with my life because as we can see you had a lot of other directions that you could have pursued so that's wonderful adding something here i mean it's mm. quite dramatic so <laughs> there was a great chance <laughs> there was a great chance that i could have pursued theater you know mm-hmm. as an actor there was a great chance mm-hmm. but then uh, one fine day i returned from my daily rehearsal uh, from college you know we used to we had a, a bunch of um, college kids and we used to set plays and perform here and there you know smaller places we used to love doing it uh, we won competitions and all that so one this particular day uh, my parents just made me sit after dinner and they said um, that you have to decide right now if you want to pursue dance or if you want to pursue theater and you can do only one thing mm. and you know those were the days like you know those many years ago in the typical indian middle class culture kids listened to their parents there wasn't that option of saying that i will do what i want to do because you know like i could see the point that they were trying to bring to the table and um, so i thought for a moment and i said i want to pursue dance and then that day onwards i did not step my foot on the stage to act in plays wow <laughs> yeah quite some commitment i would say <laughs> great story and you know it kind of hinted at my next question which it is you know somewhat personal question but you know was it challenging having your mother both as mom and as guru and which it sounds like she kind of prepared you for that time of like you need to to make the choice you know you were in your later teens when you said this is what I'm going to do seriously as my career so it kind of seems like she was aware of making sure that you were making that decision but yeah I I'm just curious how that worked as both mother and guru <laughs> it's quite interesting because obviously we had our good and bad moments i mean obviously but uh, i think um, one good thing that my mom did was that she never pressured me or forced me to dance mm-hmm. uh, since my early days uh, actually she was scared that if she put a lot of pressure on me if she pushed me too much i would go away i would yeah. you know um, revolt so yep. uh, so she kind of took it easy um uh, she never said that oh no you have to come to class you have to learn no she just let me do whatever i wanted to do but in turn i was really really interested in dancing so there wasn't this problem at all i always wanted to be in the class i wanted to learn from her mm. i wanted to watch her every rehearsal and learn from it so that conflict early, in early days it on, thankfully uh, we didn't come to that 
but then even in the later years in my late teens she she let me do everything that i liked my even my father he let me do everything I, at, uh, that i liked uh well i have already told you how they kind of held my hand and brought me in the on the right path mm-hmm. uh my mother has a very balanced personality so she is so you know that kind of a balance where as a mother you are strict to your kids because you want them to be on the track and to be well behaved and all that disciplined but as a guru she was also a bit lenient towards me which did not make me compelled to do things in class so she gave me that that freedom that leeway in class so that i look started looking up to her as my guru not just as a mother hmm. you know that kind of a balance so uh, she i think she struck the best possible balance in being a mom and a guru when it came to training me uh, but then later on when we started uh, performing on stage because she had me when she was just 18 years old right. so not much difference you know like those typical uh, times in india back then she got married when she was 17 and she had me when she was 18 mm-hmm. so um, uh, so we looked like sisters even now we look like sisters mm-hmm. and she's a very beautiful lady uh, who has uh, who's kept herself very fit physically and mentally so it was wonderful to perform with her on stage i started performing with her s- since i was about 19 20 years old and um, i used to oh my god i used to look up look forward to those moments uh, with her on stage and then from there i think we developed a great chemistry not just as two dancers performing together not just as a guru and shishya performing together but also as two women you know that's mm. that's how i think uh, we developed uh, we got into a wonderful relationship that we had wow yeah it sounds like a real blessing of a wise mother <laughs> wise and mother for the mother the blessing of a daughter who you know naturally created this bond through dance through your own love of dance so it's it's so a very true. beautiful relationship thank you for mm-hmm. sharing about that it's a, it's a inspiring and something special and i think if people were to see you perform with your mother then they would have that kind of understanding too of what mm-hmm. is happening on the stage and what brings that extra special something to that performance so amazing So you started training seriously with your mother and you know now you've performed all over the world and you know really had a robust career as a performer but I'm curious in your early days performing you know was it was it fun or was it stressful was it maybe it was different every time but I'm just curious of when you were starting performing what was that feeling like or that experience like to begin on the stage Mm. I think for me performance has always been very exciting and very fun filled so mm. I have always looked forward to performing um thankfully my mother also let us enjoy I mean me and my fellow dancers who were also training under her we all loved our moments in every step of the performance right from makeup dressing up hairstyle checking out the stage performing and the aftermath like dinners together right. or even the rehearsals like that would go on for hours uh, on a day in a day so um we loved everything that was actually uh, that, that was a part of it and my mom let us enjoy our time with it um somewhere in the process i also started training with the greatest tabla maestro of india pandit suresh tarwalkar ji who is my other guru my um, uh, along with my mother and even after i started training with her he had a very different uh, style of training which was very rigorous very mm-hmm. focused and which would you know drain a person at the end of the day there wouldn't be any energy left inside uh, but even then when he he would you know uh train me for a performance with his special repertoire his special knowledge bank you would always say that even if i'm sitting in the first row the moment you step up on stage you are the queen of that empire 
the mm-hmm. stage is your empire it's you know it's something that you own for that period of time so don't think about anything else don't think don't worry about anything else and you make your choices you make your decisions and just rule the stage hmm wow <laughs> that's that's a powerful uh, perspective mm-hmm. and hmm so i often ask this question to musicians and you know we've all you've been studying this art form for for many years now beginning as a child and for me as a student of of rag hindustani rag music i see these interesting points where like you know the first 5 8 years i was only aware of so much and then the next you know 5 8 years i become start seeing a n- new things that i didn't see before and i'm wondering if maybe you can summarize or mention a few points that you have come to in your understanding of of dance from maybe in the decades like the first 10 years the next 10 years and the next 10 years um because i think the beauty of these art forms is they just never do end and we're always seeing new possibilities and and new things so i love to hear people who have you know been seasoned in an art form and and what they have to share on this concept that's a wonderful question will mm. and only a musician who's as as immersed as you are into music can think of this question mm. for a podcast um i would just go back and relate this question to how i learned and what happened with myself mm-hmm. so when i was uh, young that means in the early 70s exam certification music certification was already a part of indian performance art training system mm-hmm. okay so there was gandharva mahavidyalaya the foremost music university in india they offered certification so there was syllabus there was there were things to follow year 1 year 2 year 3 now uh, even in those days there were two ways of training the students one following the certification and two following the guru shishya parampara Mm-hmm. now guru shishya parampara has always been about going into depth learning a small thing and finding out anything and everything around it about it and that's how basically you start going deeper and deeper with every passing year mm-hmm. now with the certification what happens is as you are going deep you are also going out you know so it's like a, like a horizontal spread Hmm. for example it's a truth it's a it's a widely known truth that uh, even if a dancer has to master just taal teen taal it would take about 10 years to do that and then even at the end of the 10th year um, one would feel that oh there's so much more to learn but now in the exam system what happens is in the first year you learn teen taal in the second year you learn little bit of jhap taal the third year you learn more of jhap taal and little bit more of teen taal with other forms other compositions so it's like a i would say it's like a good widespread growth if mm-hmm. i mean yeah. so i trained in this way until i was 20 years old and after that i found myself in the guru shishya parampara under both my gurus so i think in my case what happened and i think that has proved um, to uh be beneficial not just in my case but even in my students cases as well going forward when i started teaching so the first 10 years or first i would say first 15 years of the training you just focus on getting your lay tal right getting your fund- fundamentals right and just getting more and more no- knowledge horizontally and then finally you start diving deeper and deeper so that you focus on that particular area you focus on the one taal and then study it for 2 years 3 years 4 years and trust me once you study that one taal for that long with that intensity it actually gives you insight into all other taals right you know you must have noticed that's what um, indian gurus do when it comes to music you learn yaman you learn bhopali you learn bhim palasi with first two three ragas you give so much time and so much uh, focus to it that the next ragas just come naturally to you yes and i think that's the beauty of um, indian classical musical tradition 
so just to sum it up this is how my journey was and then i followed it going forward teaching my students as well uh, and it really gave us a two fold awareness of the art i would say vertical as well as horizontal hmm, hmm. that's a yeah. really great explanation and i completely relate to the musical way and yeah there's there's some benefit to being aware of what you call the horizontal of okay there are these other talls and mm-hmm. you know or musically these other rags but there's so much value to also just <laughs> spending 10 years on <laughs> one rag one tall because it's actually informing you of the foundations of how rag and tall are even structured so um that's something i always like to emphasize and share with other musicians is like you know wow i've been playing this rag for 10 years and i'm still learning new things about it or it's actually helping me to pick up other things faster and yeah this is the beauty of of indian classical arts is this such a depth to the aesthetic mm-hmm. and the mm-hmm. the tradition so thank you for sharing that and you know i i think for those who aren't so familiar with kathak i don't know that they would be aware of how deeply involved in the rhythm you are many people are aware of tabla being a complex rhythmic instrument but for those listening these kathak dancers are often following exactly what the tabla player is playing and you mentioned you know your your tabla uh, guruji who you, you learned under intensively so there is this deep interconnection between the rhythm coming from the tabla and the dance the movement and the storytelling i'm curious if you might be so kind to just even recite one phrase just so someone can hear this language that that is coming into dance from the from the tabla that's wonderful uh, so in kathak the rhythm is recited with the help of various languages the first and foremost is the language of kathak which is our own language hmm. which is formed with syllables like ta the ta tik da dik dik thun so on and so forth hmm. these are the f- fundamental syllables of the language of kathak and then in addition to that we have um, rhythms from the language of tabla as well as pakhavaj the two main percussion instruments that go hand in hand with kathak uh, and in addition to that we also sometimes just for fun just for freshness use the number language uh, mm. you know creating rhythm with numbers that mm. is called ginti and uh, there are some exotic compositions which use the language in a little bit of a different way which tries to copy the sounds of various musical instruments or the birds or mm. the um you know like small uh, elements from the nature and uh, catch those sounds and put them into the composition mm. so these are all the i would say literary elements linguistic elements in kathak now i will recite for you one um very um, special banaras gharana composition banaras is the gharana to which i belong hmm. so it goes this way it's in drut teen tal dhan dhan na na dhan dhan na na tin tin na chak dhan dhan na dha dhan na na dhan dhan na na tin tin na dha dhan ta dha ta kit dha tak ka thunga ta kit tak ka kir dha tik dha gati tik dhigan na gati tik ka kit ta gan dha tik ta gan dha na gan na dha gati tik gan na tik gati tik gati tik gita gita na ताधा गिननद गिगति तक गिननद गिगति तक गिगति तक गितान गितान ताधा गिननद गिगति तक गिननद गिगति तक गिगति तक गितान गितान ताधा दन्ना ना दन दन्ना तन तन्ना तक धन तक ता वाह क्या बात है थैंक यू ब्यूटीफुल सो या दिस इज ग्रेट बिकॉज़ आई आई वांटेड पीपल टू हियर व्हाट दिस रिलेशनशिप इज लाइक एंड या आई आई डोंट नो ऑफ सो मेनी dance styles where the music rhythm and the actual movement is so interconnected it's beautiful mm-hmm. to to hear that <laughs> wow <laughs> thank you so for you as a kathak dancer you know this what you just recited this musical side is a big part of it you spend a lot of time you know learning the rhythm and the syllables and the thals but also the storytelling is a big part of it and you know for me as a sitar player the rag instrumental music is is fairly abstract and a little more introspective 
So one of the things that I really enjoy when I play for a Kathak performance is that it brings out this element of storytelling. <laughs> and with this aspect of Kathak, I'm wondering if you could share some thoughts about the use of rag and tal as vehicles for storytelling. Definitely, definitely. Mm. I would like to say that I got this insight about how mm, music, I mean to say instrumental, vocal uh, music and dance kind of connect to bring out the total essence of the art. So my Guruji, Pandit Suresh Ji is the one who's, although he's a tabla player, he's so well-versed, so knowledgeable and so immersed into the entire uh, musical activity that he always passes on uh, such knowledge to uh, his disciples. I can give you one example and again it comes from a piece that Suresh Ji helped me put up. So um, the, the story is uh, the, I would say, the protagonist in the story, the main character in the story is a woman who is waiting for her lover to come home. And uh, this particular type is called a Khandita Naika. So uh, what happens is she waits for the whole night, her lover is going to return or in the early evening, but he doesn't and she's waiting for him. She decorates the house, she gets ready. Uh, she makes all sorts of preparations for him and she's looking for, forward to spend the night with him. He comes home, he returns only in the morning. And uh, that too with the telltale signs on, his, on him, uh, which tell her that she has been with somebody else. So then what follows is the fight between them. And then finally she terminates the relationship and she drives him away. Now you can imagine how intense this would be for a performance. So now thinking about the music that is involved uh, in this. So um, we chose a bandish, which was um, which is a creation of Pandit Jagannath Bua Purohit. He was a very famous uh, musician and composer of his times, and he wrote under the pen name of Guni Das. Hmm. And the bandish is in Lalat, Rag Lalat, which mm. is a morning melody. Now, the bandish is somewhat like that. Jare jare balam va, jare jare balam va. Jhuti bachan, jhuti preet, nithur nidar tori, jare jare balam va. And the antara goes, Kaho goni dasa ab, Paiya parat ka muse, Rama sang ki no kapat, Satan sang jage, Sagari ren rasa paake chare So it goes like that. Hmm, now, uh, since it's uh, Rag Lalat, uh, it's a morning melody. So the assumption is that she has waited until the morning, right? Yeah. But there's a lot that happens before that, before the bandish starts. Mm. So she's getting ready, she decorates the house, so on and so forth. So Guruji employed the uh, ragas in such a way, in the prelude for the bandish, that the passage of the time, the passage of the night would be evident just through the selection of the ragas. Wow. So we started with Nand, which is early evening. Mm -hmm. Then we had Kedar. Then we had Sohni. So going deeper into the night and then finally Lalat. So with, mm -hmm. the, with the sequencing of ragas, uh, the passage of time was evident. As I was, you know, doing my abhinay, as I was doing my storytelling with the help of the music. So this is a wonderful mm. example of how music can actually add a lot of um, add a lot of meaning to storytelling. And in the same way uh, about tal, most of the times, uh, simple um, rhythmic cycles like teen tal, ek tal are used uh, for storytelling because then you don't have to really count beats and hear the tal carefully. It just goes on at the background and it kind of becomes a second nature. You really don't have to pay attention to it. It just mm -hmm. offers a good background for the bandesh and for the dancer. 
So uh, this is what I could think of at the moment, honestly. Well, that's a great example. And another just perspective of how, yeah, rag can be used for storytelling and for this type of uh, performance. So I love hearing that. And yeah, as I mentioned, I, I love when I perform for Kathak, just getting to see these stories be told. And like you mentioned, the choice of rag is always kind of correlating to what's happening in the story. Um, and from what I understand, historically, you know, rag and dance, they were all kind of categorized. Often in the treatises and texts, they were often written about together. So I find it, yeah, interesting and exciting to kind of see them at work together. So Yes, that's so true, because all these art forms evolved together, hand in hand. They were practiced together, performed together. So um, they have been always very co cohesive. But uh, just adding something to the uh, previous example that I gave, so just uh, while performing uh, this Khandita Naika on stage, even the uh, light designing played a very big part in it. Right. Because there were, there were different times of the evening involved. So the light designer actually added a lot of value to the performance here. I bet, yeah. Yeah, there are so many elements in a Katak mm -hmm. performance with the stage and the setup. And one of my questions on this topic is, you know, I imagine touring can be difficult when you are dealing with so many things with the stage and the sound check and you just got into a new city and you may have been traveling for a month before and you have, you know, all these dancers to coordinate with and, you know, something always comes up inevitably when we're traveling and what is something that you do to just become centered and kind of grounded before you go onto the stage often you might only have a few minutes to just um, mm. collect yourself and I'm curious some practice or any thoughts on <laughs> what you do to prepare <laughs> That's an amazing question because as musicians, we all know in what precarious situations we yeah. land when we are traveling and, you know, there's no end to it. There's no yes. end to the drama. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So what do I do to center myself? Um, you know, I start getting centered the moment I pick up my makeup brush. Hmm. That's the honest answer because the moment I start applying my makeup, it kind of with every stroke, I kind of release myself from the world. I am, you know, getting into my musical world with every stroke of my makeup. When I'm completely ready and starting to warm up the basic tatkar with a nice um, tabla theka or a nagma playing in the background, once I start my tatkar, you know, that is so meditative. Mm. That's, that, that's my step two to let aside all the clutter and just focus on the performance. Yeah. Then uh, if I have uh, a lot of time uh, before the performance, I also do some chanting. I have some specific uh, stotras that I like to chant. Mm. And uh, you know the power of words, right? I mean, those words chanted in that particular way, they always help you center. They always uh, help uh, bring the mind in the right place. Um, and the last, I would say, magic is watching the breath and, and trying to control the breath. So I think when I'm doing tatkar, when I'm chanting, that's what is exactly happening to me. But then if I do it thoughtfully, it, it's always giving me better results, I would say. So, you know, like trying to control the breath, trying to stay calm, deep breaths, that always helps you ground yourself and focus yourself. So these are the three, four things that I do. But I think it's all, I mean, at the bottom line, I think it's all temperamental. Hmm. I am generally speaking, I'm a very balanced person. I don't get upset. I don't get uh, heated up a lot with, you know, small things. I don't like to be outside. I like more to be inside. So I think that's all matters when it comes to touring and performing in different scenarios. Yeah, that's that's a good <laughs> point. And yeah, I think what you shared about just breath is is very applicable to anyone in any field of, you know, yeah. performance or just a way to prepare and kind of get centered in the body. But yeah, this is a fun question because a lot of times people just laugh at me and they're like, I don't ever have time, <laughs> you know, or, you know, people are just like, well, a lot of people, once I start tuning, I, I go and I forget and 
there's a point when we start to just get into our craft and into that space where everything else goes away. So this is just great to share with people and other performers. So. Yes. So mm-hmm. true. A lot of times there's need for centering and focusing when you are actually performing on stage. We talked about everything that goes at the backstage, mm. but even during performance, sometimes a microphone would not work. Sometimes, mm. uh, you know, somebody's phone would ring or somebody would cough. Kids would run. There are a lot of things that yeah. can happen. Yeah. And even those times during the performance, it really helps if you have some tools at your disposal with which you can stay calm and stay focused. Definitely. <laughs> Thank you for sharing those. <laughs> And, well, I want to be sure to talk about your international school of Kathak and, you know, just the amazing reach that you have internationally and presence. And I think I would say this may be one of your great achievements as a, as a Kathak teacher is kind of reaching so many people to con- carry on this tradition. And I'd love for you to just share a little bit about the school from your own words. And, yeah, I'd love to get into that. Thank you for the question. So um, my international school of Kathak is my baby, basically. Mm. I founded SISK, as we call it, Shambhavi's International School of Kathak. So we just call it SISK. I founded it in 2010 uh, with, uh, the, with the thought that the school should give more options and opportunities to students from various parts of the world to connect with Kathak. So um, before that, uh, I completed 30 years of my teaching career last year in 2010 and for the first thank you for the first 20 years of my career I was teaching under the umbrella of my mother's uh, institute that is Manish Anrityale which is a very old and established institute back in India Hmm. and in 2010 I started off with SISK coincidentally I moved to the US it was a family move I moved Hmm. to the US in 2012 Hmm. So SISK, which was actually founded in India, became international in the real sense with my move. Mm-hmm. So then I started teaching in the San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, my my sister-in-law, who is also my fellow student, my mother's disciple, her name is Tejaswini Sathe. So she uh, started working as the director of SISK India. So um, between the two of us, we manage our uh, global activities. And very recently, um, I launched um, the distance learning program under the auspices of SISK. This is one insight that COVID has given me, Hmm. honestly speaking. I was never open to teaching online. I was never open to doing workshops online. But then during COVID, you know, the circumstances taught me that all this is possible Hmm. and then I kind of tried to gain more and more expertise to become a better online teacher to become a better online um, uh, educator then I thought that uh, you know like just to give you a small example during COVID a lot of students who could not connect with me earlier started attending classes Hmm. uh, started training with me online But then there was this constraint of the time zones. For example, if I have my class at 7 p.m. PST, then it's not possible for someone from the East Coast or someone from Australia or Singapore to attend the class. That actually set me to think about the distance learning program. So I have just launched it three weeks ago, and Mm. um, it's going to be um, navigated with the help of uh, video lessons. So I make a video lesson beforehand and then deliver it once a week to the students. And then at the end of the period of two months, we have a Zoom class where we work on whatever we learned. We work on it face to face uh, at a time, help them practice, help them fix the nuances, so on and so forth. Hmm. So, so far, the, the, the response has been great. So we Mm. kicked off with uh, 19 students from five countries and 17 cities. Wow. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, that was good for starters, I guess. Yeah. Uh, So I'm looking forward to see how the distance learning program develops in future. Wow, that's really a great kind of concept and adaptation because it allows the student to have, you know, good material that they can Mm. work on and then they get to connect with you, you know, 
to kind of check up on all of it because that's a great point. It is hard to do things live online when you have different time zones and you know different living situations for people mm -hmm. i know for me like i don't have a music studio and we do everything in one one room of our home so this kind of i think it's a very inspiring and well thought out way to execute this teaching and you know i think the funny thing about COVID is seeing such ancient traditions kind of come to life in, in the modern world through technology. And it's, it's very much a positive thing when it allows us to reach more people. And I congratulate you for that endeavor. Thank you so much. It was actually this idea was paid off when uh, one person signed up and she works at, and she works for American Navy, hmm. this girl. Um, hmm. She's, uh, you know, an Indian American and uh, she said that I'm going to be posted on a different ship every two years. Hmm. So if not for distance learning program, it wouldn't have been possible for me ever in my life right. to pursue Kathak. Wow. So uh, when I, uh, after I talked to her, I really kind of, you know, that nice feeling inside that you're, you're doing something right and it's helping somebody out there. Wow, beautiful. <laughs> So if anyone is curious to, to find your school and, and look up your distance program, where can we direct them? So um, best way is, I think, Facebook or Instagram, because most of my publicity happens uh, through social media. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, uh, we have a website, siskdance.com. So even through the website, they can get in touch with me and I'll guide them further. Great. Is there any other upcoming event or anything you would like to share with with listeners that they may look forward to <laughs> um since last six months since june 2020 i have been running a master class series ah. and which has been very well attended from all students from all parts of the world so we did a session on abhinay that is storytelling we did a session on uh, the technique of Kathak, and then we had one related to the sanskar, you know, I don't know how to translate sanskar in English, but that's something uh, which uh, which is related to the conduct of a student around music. So uh, the next one um, in the masterclass series is going to be about padhant, the recitation of rhythm. Mm -hmm. And that is going to be in the first week of March, which I will, I'm going to announce next week. So uh, besides uh, that, you know, with no performances going on, and I hate to perform on, you know, Facebook. <laughs> so I, so I, I haven't been doing that at all. So just uh, looking forward to um, getting the vaccine and then getting back to normal as soon as we can. Yes. Uh, you know, resuming performances, resuming workshops, resuming travel, actually. Yes, indeed. I, I definitely look forward to that, too. And uh it's been long enough that we really uh, miss it and we'll be so grateful to be back. And there's nothing like a, a live audience and live performance. And I'm the same way. I, I'm not that inspired to <laughs> perform online as much. But um, very, very exciting. These master classes and the distance learning. I think that's just awesome to see that teaching continue, even given the circumstances. And actually, at the end of the day, serving more people through this new platform. So, well... Shambhaviji, it's just been really a pleasure to speak with you and all of these wonderful topics we covered. I, I know that our listeners will really enjoy them. And yeah, I hope we can meet when, when things start happening again. <laughs> thank you so much, Will. This was really wonderful. I loved every minute of it. And thank you so much for having me on your podcast. My pleasure. I would just like to take a moment and say thank you for your continued support of the World Music Podcast. You can continue to support us by taking a moment to review and subscribe to this podcast. It's been really fun uh, sharing these personal, inspiring interviews with the world. And if you're curious to check out some more of my other offerings, like my own original music, my online course, and my instrument shop, please do visit willmarshmusic.com for all of those in one compact area. And again, thanks so much for the support. We'll see you on the next episode.